I'm going to be speaking to you this afternoon on the topic of the mystery of the covenant. I'm calling it a primer. I wasn't and still not totally sure exactly how I should start this particular message today. I think we all know that our nation's in trouble. Well, we know it, we hear about it. But I think sometimes we hear it, we understand it, but we all, oftentimes for some people, they let that message bring them down. They lose hope. They lose their biblical sense of vision. Now, it's not entirely their fault. I blame a lot of people, including us ministers. I don't take total responsibility for that. Because I do believe, maybe it'll come out in this message, that far too many of us as a Christian people, we ought to be far more individually responsible for our Christian faith than what we are, and we put too much of that upon ministers or ministries. We're facing a problem today. We're facing an enemy. We can call that enemy the Edomites. We could call that enemy the Antichrist. We could call that enemy a lot of names. But for some reason today, and you know it as well as I do, that communism is coming before us. The issue of communism is staring us in the face in such a way that we cannot avoid it. We're going to have to under, understand what communism is. We're going to have to deal with that enemy and that reality that has crept into our nation now, while I'm saying that, I am under no, I know for a fact that God Almighty has allowed Obama into office. We've worked for him. We've had a, our, most of the American, many of the American people have a, have a socialistic mentality in areas that they wouldn't even believe. If I, but if I could show them and that I could have enough time with them, I could deprogram them. I look forward to the day when the sons of God can go forward in their ministry and do some serious deprogramming. Or maybe I could say it, reprogramming for the kingdom of God. Now, Obama is a puppet president. But Obama is a very dangerous man in a number of ways. Because he was trained to be a Bolshevik communist. I'm going to say this as lovingly as I can, or maybe, uh, well, maybe in the true sense of love, huh? <laughs> I believe with my whole heart, ladies and gentlemen, that if Obama were alive during the Bolshevik Re Revolution, he would have been participating in the outright murder of Christians. Millions. Obama is not in power today because he loves us and wants to help us. So, the issue is, because I need to cut to the chase here, communism versus the Puritan understanding, biblical kingdom view. The Puritans learned of communism. They actually practiced communism for a while, and they found out it's killing us. We're dying. And if we continue to practice the ways of communism and socialism, we're going to run out of food. All we're doing is training people to be lazy people, lazy Christians. We're teaching people how to be the type of Christians that most people are today. Are we, do we really believe that the form of Christianity that is being practiced by most, quote, Christians today, I don't care what form you, name you want to put on them, 
that that's really the type of Christian that's going to help America, bring America out of this problem? Is it doing anything to awaken? Now, I know, and thank God, there are remnants of people that are coming up now that are that are, are showing that they have a deeper understanding of, of God's law. There are good things that we can look at, but there are also a lot of serious problems that are affecting our nation today, and I believe they're because Christians have let their guard down. Christians have not had a, a, a firm foundation and, and vision for the kingdom of God like our Puritan forefathers did. There is no doubt, especially when you watch this film tonight on Monumental, that there is some type of paradigm shift that took place with the lives and the hearts of those people that we've got to have. We need to search it out. We need to research it. This film will help us do that to some degree tonight. But if we had the togetherness, if we had the same vision and concept of Christianity, true biblical Christianity that those people had today, we wouldn't have Obama as our president. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't even have George Bush. We would have had solid Christian men that, were, that would love God's word, that would come before the American people and read God's law before them. They would bring light and truth to this nation. We would be a strong, sound nation today. We would be a light to the other world out there. I want to tell you right now, the third world countries out there, they would be loving us today if we had a Christian leadership the way that we should have. If America was a Christian nation the way that the Puritans came to this nation and founded that vision, they would be blessed. But they're hurting today, and they're only aiding in their own their, their self-destruction but Christians today, shame on Christians today for being ignorant. Well, we can sit here and pass the blame all that we want. That isn't going to get us anywhere, but we do have an understanding of it. What I do want to try to present are some solutions and gain some understanding of this. Because, again, we've got a problem. And the problem is we have a communist in the White House. Well, does it problem just in there? That's only the tip of the iceberg, because they have a communist. He has a communist staff. There, are the, the 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 halls of of uh, the White House are loaded with people with a communist love, love for communism, a socialist mentality, and they are practicing their socialistic engineering upon we, the people today. And it's very, very dangerous when you understand what is going on here. I mean, you should understand, there, sh there shouldn't be an American alive today that doesn't recognize the fact that we have been practicing communism way before Co Obama ever became president. We should not e ever have had a graduated income tax because that's one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto. We shouldn't have this type of federal educational system that is being regulated from the very White House. And let me tell you something, folks. There are so many things I could tell you. I only got a little bit of time here. But when you wake up to the fact that they have this Agenda 21 program that is coming against our property rights, that is, they are using the White House, they are using the federal laws and regulations. By the way, the president controls that White House controls all regulations. They come from the White House. The, the president has such power today, a lot of people think, well, he'll, you know, yeah, boy, if we could just get him in there, he'd elect some Supreme Court judges that'll help us out. Well, how did that work with, with Bush's appointments? But when you look at all these regulatory agencies, the EPA, the going to the National Forest, and all these other things here, they all working together to destroy our nation today, and I'm talking about through the United Nations also. Now, the banking system is making a lot of this possible for them today. 
Uh, I'm just going to briefly say this because I'm going to do it. We do need to have a firm biblical understanding of the Jubilee. And I don't know, but any way, shape, or form that God's people can be a, a part of bringing down the power of the Federal Reserve, exposing it in its nature, in its Antichrist spirit, in its communist agenda, in, in its unbiblical banking practices and principles that are being utilized through that agency. I mean, how can we ever come, become truly a Christian nation, a Christian people, when we have this alien enemy power in the Federal Reserve, in the IMF, and, you know, you look at all of these, all of these international banking powers are interconnected. Don't you think for a minute that the people that are over there controlling the euro dollar, what is happening to the economy in Spain, what is happening in uh, Greece, what is happening in Europe, it's all being manipulated the same way that we are being manipulated today. I believe it's a communist conspiracy. Now, I'm, I really mean that. I'm not just being funny here. You may think, well, you be, no, I'm not. I really believe, if you understand what it's all about, that it is a communist conspiracy. We're seeing the terrorists raise their heads today like never before, are we not? Oh, my gosh. It's not by accident that these things are happening. But also, I praise God that we can see these things happening. Because God's given us an understanding of His Word. Thank God we have a biblical understanding that we can read God's Word, gain vital light and truth, and see, wow, these things God's predicted. God's told us these things would come about. We're seeing them. So we can have peace in the midst of this storm that's going on right now. But it is a communist conspiracy because they can taste it. Their objective is to destroy Christendom. They've experienced to some degree the power of the kingdom of God, not in its fullest, obviously, but they've experienced that. The Puritans are Puritans. Now, God bless the Puritans. And what I want to say to you, too, is why can't we be Puritans? Shame on us if we just stand here today and at this conference and we hear this good news and we think, well, that was for them. There's nothing we can do about it now. What? You mean you can't read, you can't study, you can't apply yourself to these principles and growing and well, let's just call it the Puritan faith. If we can't grow in that understanding and we can't start coming together Uniting together, loving one another together, supporting one another in the kingdom principles that these people had and apply them. But the enemy's so big, the enemy's so powerful, the enemy's so strong. Look at all the might and the power and, and the, the money and the controls that they have. Yeah, look how big our God is. I'm looking for a David company of people, a Daniel company of people that come forth and say that to God's people and shake them to their very core to get them to wake up somehow to their biblical duties and responsibilities and to realize there is something we can do about it. There, how dare us just sit around and let the enemy walk all over us today? Do you think for one minute that the Puritans would have done that? Oh, let me assure you, when you watch this film, this documentary tonight, you're going to realize, whoa, we're a bunch of spiritual wimps today. Christians have become complacent. There is something very devious and evil about the type of Christianity that is being taught and lived today. It would be working. 
I'm not saying there wouldn't be hardships, there wouldn't be difficulties to overcome. As a matter of fact, yay, they should be there. But we, the Bible says, can be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We can take God's word. We can take the principles that are in there, extract those principles, and we can apply them to our family, apply them to our children, apply them to our community, apply them to our nation. I want to tell you right now that just a few of us can put thousands to flight. If we would just start acting upon and believing and standing in faith and quit looking at and, and focusing on, oh, look at the power of the enemy. What can we do? Well, with that attitude, you ain't going to do nothing. But with a biblical faith, a solid biblical understanding of God's will, plan, and purposes, and we come together, and we get the right spiritual demeanor and reality and view of what God has before us, I don't, we could say, we don't understand it all. We don't know what to do. We're just going to take what little bit you're giving us right now, Jesus, and we're going to be gullible enough to go out and do it and apply it. And we're going to trust you, Jesus, for the right results. Are we really trusting in him? Are we looking at outward circumstances and conditions too much? I think we are. Oh, but brother, if I could have been alive at the time of Christ, I would have been right there, boy, standing with Jesus. I got a feeling most of us wouldn't. We would have run off the first week, probably, the persecution set in. What if we just had more people, you know? If, if the numbers were there, Pastor, if the money was there, if the support was there, it would make all the difference. Yeah, we, what? Then you have no biblical faith. We've got to get the biblical faith. Well, I'm going to get kind of strange on you here. I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago about the South. And I told them, because I is a Southerner from Texas, I believe that on many of the principles, the South was right. You know what their response to me was? There's no way, brother, because the South lost. <laughs> now listen, I want you to think about what I'm telling you there. What are, what are they telling me? They're telling me, look at the outward circumstances and conditions. The South lost. Therefore, your argument is a losing argument. You know what I told them? I could use your argument on Jesus because they took him to the cross and they crucified my Savior. And therefore, he lost. Christianity must be wrong if I use your argument. You look at the suffering and the tribulation that have happened to true Christian followers, true dedicated Christian people. The Antichrist element, whoever you want to think of them right now, they hate that type of spirit and that kind of dedication. And they're going to do everything they can to make an example out of you and stomp you down and keep you down. Is it okay to stick my head up? Is it okay if I... Open my Bible. We have people that won't come to church here because, well, they're afraid that somebody may take their picture or see their license plate out there. <laughs> really? Well, first of all, do you think what we're teaching here is biblical truth or not? Oh, yes, brother, I believe it. Well, then why aren't you in here supporting the truth? That's not the emphasis of what I'm trying to make here, but I'm trying to make a point. If you went back to Jesus and you looked at the gospel that he taught, wow, man, 
I mean, everywhere he went, they just fell all over themselves. They loved him so much that they were fleeing from him at the end. Now, if I looked at the biblical examples and I looked at the numbers, then I would say, I'm not going to follow Jesus. It, it, it costs too much to do that. Look what happened to the followers. Do you know we had far more disciples than 12, don't you? Way more than 12. I think a lot of them ran off. You know, as long as the healings were going on and the blessings were there, hey, you can get a crowd in. But when it comes down to the work of the kingdom and the work of the gospel, where are they? Where are they? There has to be a covenant understanding. There has to be a covenant paradigm shift. Now, there are lots of, again, principles that we could go over. But we have to understand, first of all, there's a problem and that we have to change. I'm not waiting on the world out there or the Christian world out there to change. Why can't we agree, come into agreement, come into covenant and say, why can't we do it here? Why can't we change? I think there are some deep possibilities that are available to us today. I want to share this quote, to, quote with you. This is from Thomas Jefferson in 1785 in a letter, his letter to James Monroe. He said this, quote, My God, how little do my countrymen know what precious blessings they are in possession of and which no other people on earth enjoy. I like that so much, I'm going to read it again. My God, how little do my countrymen know what precious blessings they are in possessions of. I don't think we know what precious blessings we're in possession of. Oh, yes, I do, brother. We got the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we've got, we've got this uh, federal support, and, and uh, we've got the United Nations, you know. And, uh, you know, we got a great, powerful military. Really, those are your precious possessions? You know, one thing is very evident that there's a lot of people, especially Christians, that aren't feeling so secure anymore in this world. I told the speakers the other day, I said, uh, it was on uh, Thursday morning, I woke up bright and early the day before the conference, and oh my gosh, Negative news after negative news about the economy like I haven't heard in a long, long time. And the market was going down, down, down. And they had speaker after speaker and expert after expert that this is bad. I mean, it's doom and gloom all over the place. And I just had to smile to myself. It made me feel good. First of all, because I see Babylon coming down. But uh, also... It was a time for me to give a little spiritual attitude check. Are you going to get down in doom and gloom over this? You know, we're kind of fickle, are we not? Listen. If I hadn't told you all anything, and I would just kind of change my agenda a little bit, and I would have come before you with doom and gloom, message after message, uh, reading you this negative report after negative report, I can almost guarantee you a lot of you would be walking out of here, oh, woe is us. What can we do? The enemy is so powerful. Look how big and powerful Babylon is. Don't you know they were saying the same thing about Rome in their day and time? How little do my countrymen know what precious blessings they are in possession of. 
See, I believe that we are in possession of precious, special, spiritual blessings. But if we don't have a vision for them, if we don't have a biblical understanding that they exist and that we move forward to utilize them and apply them in our life, what good are they? And yet, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the very answers to our national problems and woes are right before us. They're there. We just have to understand them, we have to apply them, and we have to live by them. And you know what that's going to require? I'm not going to go into it real deep, but I'm going to tell you right now, look to Nehemiah and the building of the wall. Now, there was a man of God with vision. And some of you may say, well, what good did it do? They built the dadgum wall, and all it did was open up the wall for these antichrists to go over there like Mitt Romney and George Bush and go over there and plant their little uh, uh, Jewish Kabbalah uh, messages on the wall there and kiss the wall and, and, uh, and kiss up to the Jewish Sanhedrin so he can get reelected, so he can get elected. Don't get me started on that one. I could really go on. I mean, hey, it's done taking a rocket scientist to figure out Obama's destroying our nation. But if you think for one minute that Mitt Romney might be the answer, <laughs> is he saying or doing anything about the war? No, he wants to, he wants to get us in a war with Iran. And as soon as the Jewish Sanhedrin gives him that phone call, he's sending our troops over there. I don't know if he's going to go over there and bomb or whatever he's going to do, but he will. Is he going to do anything about the Federal Reserve banking system? He did everything he could to insult and put down Ron Paul. That tells me a lot about that man right there. Well, I, I, think, he's, I think he's a whole lot better than Obama. Well, so do I. And I will tell you right now, Well, I shouldn't even get into the voting thing because y'all are just going to walk all over me. But um, I cannot in good conscience not go and vote against Obama. I'm sorry, folks. And if my only choice is Mitt Romney, I'd love to vote for Ron Paul. I'd love to vote for J.B. Foster, but he's not on the ticket. I'd love to... <laughs> They'd kill him. They would. I don't know how many people have told me that. Oh, if I'm worried. If Ron Paul gets in, they're going to kill him. Well, I think Ron Paul understands that. And I think Ron Paul would be willing to die for the cause because I think Ron Paul is part of the remnant company in many, many ways. Why not vote for who? Oh, you can do that. Yeah. Absolutely, you can do that. But like I said, you're opening up a can of worms that I, like I told you, if I get into the voting issue, it's just going to, uh, I know you folks. But I've told people this, I said, what? people, you're voting for the lesser of two evils. I said, yeah, you know what, even if I voted, even if I ran, you're voting for the lesser of two evils because I'm an imperfect man myself. I think I'm a whole lot better than Mitt Romney. I say that because I really mean it. I think I'm a whole lot better than Obama. I think I'd make a pretty good president. But I'm not, I'm not running. And I guarantee you they would. Heads would shake. JB is president and me is his vice president. We'll get in there and we'll make some changes, buddy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, I'll bring your gun. I want to try to wake you up a little bit more here because there's so much I cannot, because of time constraints, get into. But I've been doing a lot of reading and doing a lot of serious research into communism. 
And I know there's people that are say, well, you know, that's an old, outdated term, and, uh, and uh, maybe you should use a different term or do this or that. I, call it what you want. But you look at the fruit of it, folks. Uh, before I get into reading this, I'm going to do, I'm going to get myself a little bit more trouble here. Those, my congregation knows I get myself in trouble preaching all the time. Oh, yeah. And... You know about Batman and the movie and the shooting. And I know there's lots of information coming out about that. I've heard, been hearing Richard was sharing me some things that his father apparently was supposed to go and testify against the banking system. And uh, there was some big time stuff that he was involved in. And uh, it just might be that that young man was drugged. Now, with that being said, I want to be very clear here. I do not believe in drugs as an excuse for murdering people. I don't believe the Word of God gives us a way out on that one. And uh, uh, I think the, the God's law ought to be invoked upon that young man. Whether he was coerced into it, drugged into it, or whatever it was. But... Uh, I want to get to the Batman movie just real quick. I took my daughter to it because she wanted to go see it. She heard something about it. And uh, I said, well, okay, I'll take you because I love you. I love my girly. And uh, that doesn't mean I'll do anything. But within reason, I would. And I went with her to watch it. And uh, halfway through the movie, I'm like, ho hum, you know, this typical Batman stuff so far. All of a sudden, the, the message in the movie changed halfway through. So if you go see it, the first half. Second half blew me away. Even my, Michelle understood it. She caught on to the fact that this movie is exposing, shockingly, the evils of communism. It was showing what people's courts are capable of. It was showing the real fruit of communism. Perhaps I would dare say not even strong enough, but uh, that man who wrote that, the latest Batman, knows something. And so, to those who care to do it, I would recommend you go see it. I think you're going to be surprised at the anti-communist message it's brought out in this particular movie. But I want to share this quote to, with you. Like I say, there's a lot I cannot get into. But this quote blew me away. And it is from, and this man, his name is Anatole, uh, it looks like Lenarski. I'm going to go ahead and spell it for you in case somebody wants to look this up, okay? This particular man's name up. First name is A-N-A-T-O-L-E. His last name is L-U-N-A-R-C-H-A-R-S-K-Y. Now, he is a former Russian commissar of the educational system of uh, the communist regime over there. Actually, I could say over here. Don't we have a communist regime? As a matter of fact, I think if we could compare, we would find that communism is far more alive and well and being practiced here in the United States of America than even in the, uh, what do you call it? We don't call it the Soviet Union anymore, Russia, but that whole communist area over there. <clears throat> well, anyway, here's what he said, quote, we hate Christians and Christianity. Even the best of them must be considered our worst enemies. Christian love is an obstacle to the development of revolution down with the love of our neighbors. We want hate. Only then can we conquer the universe. Now those are pretty sobering words. Now what would really perhaps shock a lot of Christians, is I could take you to heads of our educational department and quote them 
and they are saying basically the same thing in our, with our federal tax dollars, attacking Christianity, supporting the socialist antichrist agenda of removing prayer from the school, attacking biblical principles, removing anything of a Christian foundation that might be helped and aid parents in waking up their children and giving our children a Christian foundation. One of the main ways that we can help our children and help our family is to give them a Christian education. That means that we have to take responsibility. Parents never trust the public school system. I don't care if your children are going to the public school system. God help you as a parent if you just become passive with your Christian faith and your Christian duty in giving and helping provide your children with a Christian education. They're going to have to have it. It will make all the difference in the world. But again, we need to have a covenant paradigm shift. And what I mean by this is we need to discuss some key aspects of God's calling and purposes for His people. And we need to probe some spiritual realities that we need to seriously consider. Often people neglect their biblical heritage and their biblical identity because they do not think about the calling that God Almighty has placed upon them, nor do they consider the consequences of their spiritual and moral failures. We are not called again to be quitters. We are called to be overcomers. We are called to be God's covenant people. We are called to be Israel. What does that term mean? Basically it means that we are to be a people ruling with God. Think about what I'm telling you. And are we doing that? Perhaps there's been something missing in our understanding which has helped us to drift away from the true faith that we should have. We are called to be light bearers, priests and kings, a people who have God's law written within their heart. Cities of light that shine forth the gospel of restoration and deliverance. I'm talking about true deliverance. Oh my gosh. You, my dear brother, you brought up foundations, and it just, when you were talking about it today, you just kind of made me shake a little on the inside in a good way. We have to explore that term. We have to understand what those foundations, what those biblical foundations really mean and how we are to apply them to ourselves. Am I ringing a bell here with anybody? Man. And so we have to also be doers of the word and not just hearers only. But I talked about Nehemiah and the building of the wall there. What one thing, well at least it stands out to me, concerning Nehemiah and the building of the wall stands out to you, and that perhaps, and that is Nehemiah went in there and he grabbed his workers. And he was bold with his workers. And he told them, listen guys, you hear the taunts of the enemy? You hear the threats? You hear the psych psycho Babylonian mush coming from their mouths don't listen to them you understand God's calling and purposes for what we're doing here you have this biblical vision we were called to do this for the kingdom of God for the glory of God 
Keep your eyes on Jesus, folks. Keep your eye on this covenant. Stay dedicated to the covenant calling that has been placed upon us. We are called to be overcomers. We cannot do that and listen to the enemy. Now, if you're having some spiritual problems, let me suggest that perhaps what's wrong is you're listening way too much to the enemy. And so we need, we need to have a spiritual paradigm shift where we come out of her and be not partakers of her sins. That we start walking and moving in the direction. What direction? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Abraham, look for that city whose builder and maker is God. Hallelujah. Are we looking for that city? Do we have that type of a vision? I think we do too. But is there more that we can do? That's the question. God help us if all we do is come here and gain knowledge. I, I really believe that's where we're going to have to start. But, we're being prepared for something big. I really believe it. I can't put my finger on it yet, but I believe it's coming. You know as well as I do that if we have to endure four more years of Obama, like Brother J.B. was telling us all last night, the storm is there. We're in the midst of the storm now. But I really believe, like he was telling us last night, things are going to be unleashed from the Obama administration that are... We had better be solid. We, on, we had better be on that solid biblical kingdom foundation or we will be carried away. We will be blown away by the storms of this communist and this communist force that's going to come against us in greater ways that's going to be unleashed against us that we have yet to understand. But I believe there is a right foundation we can be on and endure the coming storm. I believe that the enemy fears us standing tall for the kingdom of God. I believe that the enemy fears us coming into covenant. Now, I've got some things on covenant that I'm going to be sharing with you uh, that are really going to add to this. I want you to listen to the scripture verse from Isaiah 54, verse 17. I wanted to encourage you. Quote, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is a heritage of the saints of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Well, there's conditions there. If our righteousness is of him, good, good. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things are going to be added unto you. I believe there are great things, great spiritual things that can be added unto us, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to be with a bunch of quitters. Can you love me and hear me say that? I, it's just not in me anymore. I'm so stirred, like I said, from... from gaining this understanding, and it's just, I can't shut off the Spirit right now because the Spirit's pouring out so much revelatory truth and knowledge to me, I can't even contain it. I might explode. <laughs> In a good way. But we have a high calling, and most people have missed it because, again, they've been lost in the drama of the world. They miss the fact that there really is a better way, a better kingdom, a better way of life that is not of this world. Jesus said we are to be in the world, but not of this world. 
Please understand that we cannot pursue or function within our calling unless we understand who we are and we have a strong sense, again, of covenant. Contrary to present-day Babylonian-infused Christian thinking, God Almighty has not abandoned His purposes to Israel to now form a multicultural, multiracial Israel. What? What did you say? The covenant people are not a spiritual melting pot of man's choosing. The faith of Abraham is still of racial, dare I say, and national consequence that has not and will not bear forth fruit in any people but the true heirs of the promise. Oh, I know that's shocking. Hold on. This does not mean that non-Israelite people cannot be Christian or that they cannot gain tremendous spiritual biblical knowledge or that they cannot live fruitful and productive lives, but that they will, will not and cannot fulfill what God has not covenanted covenanted with them to do. Let me make it a little more plain for you. I do not look to China, Mexico, India, and I don't hate any of these people, by the way, Japan, Taiwan, the Filipinos, the Aborigines, or the Eskimos, for some covenant transfer. Now, if you do, you run with that vision. You know something, as loving, as nice as it all sounds, in a way, I'd like for it to be true. We're just all, you know, it's just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who Israel is. We're all spiritual Israel today. And there are, I'm not going to say that because I know that will get me in trouble. But let me put it this way to you. Spiritual Israel is tantamount to twisting Paul's teachings on grace as somehow being the end of the law. Have you ever heard that from people? We need to get our spiritual priorities right. We need to hold fast the faith, the true faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The apostle Jude said in his epistle, short epistle, but I love this verse, verse 3. I exhort you that, you should, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, if that doesn't stir you up, I don't know what will. What did he say again? I exhort you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the faith. Well, then maybe we need to get a vision and understanding of what that faith which was once delivered unto the faith is, and we need to seek to obtain it. Now, I want to tell you, I think the Puritans did this, and they had that type of a faith. Oh, they had their shortcomings, they had their failures, so do we. But there was definitely something different because Christian education, go back, and do some research on it. Christian education overflowed because God blessed the covenant that they made. They entered into covenant. What do you think the Mayflower covenant or compact was? They entered into covenant, and it was a covenant for the kingdom of God. You cannot make any mistake about that. Oh, yes, King James has mentioned it. But they clearly say for the glory of God and for His kingdom. They came here with a kingdom purpose, with a kingdom understanding, and they were, they were willing to fail and make mistakes and pick themselves up and get going with God's word and not be quitters. If we had to go through half the problems that those people had to go through even before they came over here in the United States of America, we, I, would have thrown in the towel. When you look at this film tonight and you look at what they had to go through, through before they ever left England. Oh my God. How many Christians do you know today that look at circ outward circumstances and conditions and base their faith and how they're supposed to, how their spiritual demeanor on what's happening around them? Oh, something tragic happened. God must not have been in that. 
Oh, I've heard Pastor Barley's coming under persecution by the media over there. I wonder what he did to deserve that. Oh, Pastor Barley's church isn't filled like the Baptist church downtown. Oh, sad, you know. He's just not spiritual enough. Really? Is that what we're called to do is look at the numbers? I want to tell you something. Listen to me, folks. If that was true, the Puritans would have thrown it in the towel because they were dying like hotcakes at first. I don't know if that's a proper way to describe it, but they weren't passing on. They were dying for a while there until they got their spiritual act together and things started changing for them. But did they throw in the towel and quit, or did they press in and become overcomers? That's the question. Are you starting to see what I'm talking about a little bit more here? I hope. I hope I'm not wasting my time. Because I did not come to this conference to waste my time. I did not. What the Antichrist fear, and I do mean fear, is that Christians will come together and start living in covenant faith and having a covenant commitment and a dedication to Christ and His kingdom. This is what they fear. And I think they better fear. There are so many verses I could go over, but my time is out this morning. But let me tell you something, folks. Could there be a spiritual paradigm shift coming for us? I think there is. I'm aware of the problems. You're aware of the problems. Who isn't aware of the problems out there? I mean, I really, you know, I didn't really, personally, I didn't come to hear about the problems. I'm well aware of the problems, right? Aren't you? I got to kind of like to hear some solutions. People are like, I want to hear some specifics, Pastor. Well, I'm giving you some here. I'm giving you what the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. Let me tell you that right now. I am doing that. And I have a lot of questions about this, probably just as much as you do. But what do the scriptures tell us? Without a vision, we perish. We've got to first have that vision. The Puritans had a vision. They had a faith that we need to have. And we need to contend for that faith. What does that mean? They struggled to enter into that faith. We've got to struggle to enter into that faith. And it will make all the difference in the world. It will. And it has to do again with covenant. Boy, stay tuned. I'm looking forward to this weekend. More and more powerful things are going to be revealed. But tonight, you don't want to miss the movie, Monumental. God bless you. The gospel of Christ and Him crucified has had its place, but it hasn't transformed the world. That's right. It's not going to transform the world. The greatest asset of the kingdom message is hope. Hope for our children, hope for every age, hope for America, hope for the world, because it's the whole counsel of God's will and plan. So we have had a limited gospel for 2,000 years. Well, Yes, for 2,000 yeah. years, a limited gospel. Um, but the gospel of the kingdom, to me, is the solution for hope for our children who see nothing but chaos around them, nothing but destruction, nothing but socialistic, communistic, Marxistic asininity. And they, they, they don't have hope. So they've got to know the, the gospel of the kingdom to have hope. Jesus wins. How's he going to do it? In multiple of ways. Matter of fact, that's one of the questions I wanted to get with you tomorrow morning.